Hello everyone, welcome to Big Data Thoughts. Today we are going to talk about evolutionary architectures. Now you must have heard lot of people talking about an architecture or designing a system which is evolutionary, which can adapt to incoming changes or any kind of changes to technology requirements or anything. They expect that architecture to be evolutionary and very very robust. So today we'll talk about what actually evolutionary architecture means. Is it actually achievable? What are the things that we as architects should keep in mind so that our architecture can actually evolve with time? So let's get started. Now, what is an evolutionary architecture? Simply put, that means whatever architecture we design today should actually last for years and years and years. It should evolve with time. It should support guided incremental changes across multiple dimensions. We would look at the dimensions that um, an architecture should have, but essentially an architecture should be so flexible, adaptable, extensible that it is able to evolve with time. Now evolvability as a concept is basically a meta characteristics or an architectural wrapper that will protect all architectural characteristics. So an architecture can have multiple characteristics like it should be scalable, maintainable, extensible, auditable. There is a long list of characteristics that an architecture should have. And I have spoken about it briefly in my detailed video on architecture. So all of these characteristics should essentially evolve with time. That is what evolvability means. There should not be any end state. That means that the architecture is never portrayed that there is an end state or after which that architecture cannot scale. That should not be the situation. So it's like ever adapting, ever evolving architecture, which will never have an end state because as in when we go into the future or as years pass by, the architecture needs to keep on evolving. That's the dream goal, ideally. And it should evolve with ever changing software development because we will look at the changes that keep happening, but essentially we are we want a nirvana state or a state where the architecture doesn't have to uh, really be difficult to change it should be very very easy to change let us look at the reasons for change or what are the reasons which will drive a change into an existing architecture first of all the domain whatever domain for which we have built the architecture is also going to change nothing is starting change is inevitable so the whole domain in which that uh, use case was existing for which we build the architecture is also going to go through changes there would be changes in requirement in the scope etc which will influence the way we designed or architected then there are two major things like change in technology change in the software development ecosystem so we have seen the growth from like or the evolution from rdbmss to distributed systems etc so that is also a kind of change that is happening and that will really uh, give a push for us to change the architecture there are, we, there will be factors like version changes in the software platform level changes changes in the existing design patterns architectural patterns so all of these put together would essentially drive or push us to do a change to our architecture. But the aim is to design the architecture in such a way so that these changes have a very, very low impact. It should not be the case that the entire architecture need to be, needs to be scrapped and the use case needs to be built from scratch. So that should not be the case. We'll look into factors as to what affect the architecture and how we can keep all of this in mind but essentially the reasons for change can be domain requirements scope changes in the software development ecosystem changes in the technology which is platform uh, patterns etc anything related to technology that may change now what are the dimensions we spoke about dimensions of architecture Primarily, we can look at four dimensions. One is purely a technical dimension. Depending on the use case, what technology are we going to use? That's one dimension. So typically technical architects are there who design or architect the uh, entire system. Uh, based on the use case, they choose the technologies that are to be used and how they stitch together. That's the technical dimension. Then there is a data dimension. 
that means there are data architects who actually design the flow of data or they determine how the data should be captured transformed aggregated so those are data architects so that's the data dimension then we have security architects people who take care of the entire security of the system whether it is authentication authorization uh, encryption masking it can be other things like prevention of ddos attacks there, there are multiple ways in which a architecture is made robust in terms of security that's the job of a security architect so that's the third dimension the fourth dimension is the infrastructure infra is important because everything is sitting on top of the infra so there are specifically infrastructure architects or platform architects who understand the infrastructure the need of the use case and they design that so these are the four dimensions of an architecture and these are all moving these have moving parts so with time all four of these keep changing and that requires our architecture to also evolve now i want to talk about two concepts which are important to understand when we are specifically talking about evolution or evolvability of architecture so there is a term, term called bit rot what is bit rot bits we all know 0 1 those are bits right in computer world they are the fundamentals so bit rot is nothing but slow deterioration in the performance and integrity of data over time when there is a degradation of performance or there is a degradation in integrity of data that is known as bit rot and any use case that we pick up however brilliant the architecture or design is there will be a time when actually we would see a degrade in performance degrade in the integrity of data because of various reasons so that's one term that we all should be aware of the second and the most important thing to understand is fitness functions because this is something which actually measures or this is like a matrix to define the correctness of our architecture now, now what is fitness function we all know what is a function a function is something that takes input and produces a particular output that's a function now when we say fitness function fitness function means it defines how close a given design or solution is achieving what it, it was supposed to achieve so these are matrices that you can define to understand whether what you really wanted to achieve have you achieved that so you are defining a function which is known as the fitness function or it tells you how fit or how robust your architecture is fitness function also determines whether an algorithm has improved over time or not as time passes is your architecture actually degrading or it is proving itself to be really robust and it is getting improved it also ensures that architecture does not change in undesirable ways just to make our architecture evolve with time we may change certain dimensions which may actually not be desirable for example there is always a trade off between security and performance now for security i may want to add multiple layers to my architecture but in turn it will affect the performance because there will be some amount of lag when we are introducing multiple layers so as an architect or as a developer i need to understand what is the fitness function what is the matrix which is really applicable is performance or sla is more important or security so there has to be a middle path or a trade between the two so fitness function actually tells me how to achieve that middle path and not change the arch architecture in a undesirable way now what can be the fitness function so we understood fitness function conceptually but if we look at it matrix wise fitness function can be around auditability of the architecture performance security data scalability these are the five very very important or salient uh, dimensions or features we may call of an architecture and our fitness function should be defined around these characteristics so i should have matrices defined for auditability for performance so if i give an example right how we will define fitness function let's say i want to define fitness function for performance the matrix would be something like if it's a use case where we are deriving reports we would say the reports uh, once the reports are ready and if somebody there, there's a report or there's a dashboard that we have prepared some user goes to the dashboard clicks on a button and that 
um, graph should come up my SLA of that is 15 seconds just an example right so that's my fitness function or I should be able to see data of last five years on my dashboard that's my fitness function so these are certain matrices that I defined for for the fitness of my architecture now uh, we, we looked at all the important terms we understood what is evolvability what is uh, architecture evolution right Evo evolving architecture now we would look at certain principles that govern this so there are basically five principles the last uh, responsible moment architect and develop for evolvability postal's law architect for testability and conway's law so we will look at each of these uh, briefly to understand what are these principles and how should we apply it to make our architecture evolvable so last responsible moment what does that mean that means we should delay the decisions as long as possible but not too long now this seems cryptic but what it essentially means is we have to take time to take the decisions or the technology choices or any decision to build the architecture that should be delayed the delay here means we should collect all the necessary information so maximize the information that we have minimize the technical debt and that's what we mean by delaying the decision getting as much information as possible before designing the architecture we should decide the drivers or what drives my use case what drives my architecture what is priority so we list down all the drivers the key features we prioritize them accordingly the decision for building the architecture should be made that's the first principle to build a good evolutionary architecture second is architect and develop for evolvability there are various things that we can do as an architect to build such kind of architectures first break it down into components we don't want to have a big chunk of code which does everything we want to compartmentalize it we want to break down the functionality that we are trying to build that means we want it to be modular we want to have loose coupling we want to have cohesiveness which means one function or one service does what it is supposed to do one single thing and not just too many things clubbed into one function one service or one piece of uh, or, or a function right function or service so it has to be loosely coupled highly cohesive modular broken down into components breakdown uh, of ownership if we have clear-cut ownership defined it becomes easier have a simplistic uh, communication model simplistic architecture so that there is a ease of change there make the architecture in such a way that the change if we want to add some new thing or we want to change something it is easy to uh, do the change to debug to test in all aspects and that needs to be thought through from day one instead of doing it when we actually want to implement something new because definitely there will be some change required down the line clean up the technical debt as soon as possible because technical debt is like like having a heavy principle on which you have to pay a heavy interest so debt is like a principle if the principle is less the interest we pay is less so if technical debt is more the interest that we have to pay or the difficulties we will face will be more then there is something which is well known as postal's law postal's law states that be very conservative about what you are sending what data you are sending if you send unnecessary data which is not even required it increases your development testing debugging maintenance all of the efforts so be conservative even security efforts so conservative about sending data liberal about receiving data and one very important thing validate only what you need which means if there are two functions that are talking to each other there is a contract between them function one expects certain thing from function two and vice versa if i am while doing that i am validating too many things tomorrow the contract of the other function or the way the interface of the other function changes if i am doing validation on a lot of stuff if something changes on the other function side i have to change many things on 
my side as well because i was validating too many things so the basic rule that postal says is conservative about sending data liberal about receiving data and validate only what you need do not over consume uh, do not over send or do not over validate architect for testability which means design for test when you are designing an architecture think about how you are going to design it so that testing it doing acceptance testings testing is easy even when you are building the communication between two components there should be a messaging architecture that you have designed it should not have business logic really it should just be used as a messaging this is just an example but ideally architect for testability design the architecture keeping in mind that the testing uh, testability has to be easy it should be very easy or properly defined the acceptance test criteria or test cases should be so well defined that it is easier for business to do that acceptance uh, on the use case we are building then there is something called conway's law now conway's laws is is applicable when we talk about a big use case or a project where there are multiple teams working together if they are working in silos it is bound to have a broken communication it is very very important to define or have a good communication handshake between different components now there is a fine balance here we should not have everything so compartmentalized or so many teams involved that if there is one change required and we have te teams in disparate locations we have to actually depend on each and every one in different geographies to come together to implement that change so when i say that there there has to be a good communication handshake yes there has to be but at the same time we should not have too many people Uh, or too many uh, components defined in such a way that there is lot of dependency on different teams now broken communication means that there is a complex integration that was defined so we have to keep in mind how we are defining our integration patterns communication patterns they should be simple well defined and properly defined <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's all about all the laws uh, or principles that we should keep in mind when we are designing an architecture which we really want to scale and evolve with time okay now how can we achieve it we spoke about a couple of things while discussing this whole concept but essentially we should do refactoring refactoring is the key to building such an architecture we should have continuous delivery if we have a continuous delivery pattern defined we can actually have incremental guided changes which are best suited for certain architectures to be evolvable another aspect which i would like to talk about is choreography versus orchestration what does it mean if if we talk about an orchestra there is a person who actually coordinates the orchestra and everybody looks upon to that person to uh, for the orchestra to be a success if that person is missing the orchestra cannot take place because he is the one who is guiding the orchestra versus a choreography situation where also, where there is also a person who is actually designing that whole act but the choreographer is behind the scenes he does his job he teaches everyone then everybody takes ownership and they make it a success so we have to design or architect in such a way that it is not an orchestration or a single point of failure rather it is a choreography where everything is so well defined practiced and designed in such a way that each and every component performs their own part and makes the architecture a success so that's all about evolutionary architectures it's a dream state or a nirvana state there will would be times when there may be certain cases where we really need to rework a bit on our architecture with changing technology and other paradigms but if we keep all of these principles that we spoke about in mind our architecture would be able to scale with minimal changes i hope this video has helped you to understand the concept please like share and subscribe to the channel to get more interesting videos thank you so much